Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and I'm going to be talking about brain networks and ADHD today. I'll be talking for about 20 minutes. If you have questions while I'm talking, feel free to type them in, and I will answer them at the end of the time. This will also be posted on YouTube and Facebook afterwards. So to start with the take home message. So ADHD is intrinsically much more tied to a functional connectivity issue, so brain network issue, than it is a simple biochemical issue, even though we keep thinking it or referring to it as a dopamine problem. It's also ADHD is not simply a cultural issue. Different cultures may deal with it radically differently, but it's clearly present across cultures and again represents a how brains are hooked up and organized differences. And although we're learning a lot about the different networks that are involved in producing ADHD patterns of behavior, um, none of those advances yet have led to either diagnostic or treatment improvements. So it's interesting information. It's important. I think it will eventually lead to better diagnosis and treatment, but we're not there yet. So to start with, why, again, sort of the model for years has been ADHD is a problem of dopamine neurotransmission, maybe norepinephrine's involved as well, just give them medications that boost dopamine and everything's going to be better. And while certainly many people have dramatic improvement in ADHD symptoms from Adderall or from Ritalin stimulants, or sometimes dramatic improvement from our non-stimulant approaches, Absolutely nobody with ADHD has a complete eradication of their symptoms just from medications. And why that's worth pointing out, that is dramatically different from depression. So I'm not saying everyone treated with antidepressants responds well, but many people with depression have their depression completely alleviated by medications. So I'd say it's more fair in that condition or that scenario to be viewing it as a biochemical state or condition. Whereas again, ADHD from everything we can see is a pervasive developmental lifelong condition. That doesn't mean in different contexts it may not vary. It doesn't mean that either medication treatment can improve it. It doesn't mean that you can't learn strategies that may not just make you able to deal with it, may actually change the underlying process or connections underlying itself. Um, but again, ADHD is fundamentally tied to brain networks and how they're working. So a few words about brain networks. So often, just like we oversimplify things by saying, oh, depression's a serotonin deficit, and we came up with overly simplistic models that were so overly simplistic they weren't even true, one of my fears or worries about brain network thoughts is that people view it almost like as systems of a house, that we have a network that does the plumbing, we have something that does the electricity, we have the AC, we have the heating, we have these distinct separable um, components that can be pulled out from it. And in the brain, we have billions of cells, tens of trillions of connections between cells, and you can't just pull out one collection of cells and one collection of fibers connecting other cells and, and view it as a simple, discrete network. All of the brain networks have multiple connections, multiple inputs from each other. They have poorly defined boundaries. Even in the nomenclature and how we're currently understanding them, there, there's wide overlap in names and identification as to what structures are part of them. So this is a sloppier, messier, much more complicated system than sort of networks in your computer um, system or networks, and again, in your house or something like that. So that being said, one of the most studied and clearly defined networks is called the default, default mode network, or sometimes just the default network. And originally, this was just when we were starting to do studies using MRI and brain imaging approaches more than 20 years ago. Um, they would often 
have a specific task that they wanted the subjects to do while they were in the MRI, either paying attention to something or making calculations or thinking of something. And they would compare that for controlled purposes to a background rate, the default state of just sit there and don't think of anything was usually the command. And it turned out when they started looking more closely at what was going on, and we had evidence from EEG studies even before this, that the default state wasn't just an inactive brain, that the brain is always active. And even when you're giving it an extensively difficult task to work on, overall brain activity goes up less than 5%. So in contrast to what they were thinking many, many decades ago, that most brain cells were just inactive when they weren't thinking or performing a specific task. We know that brain cells are continuously active to a remarkable extent, and many, maybe a different way of thinking of it is the task they're doing just may be silent and not represented, uh, represented or easily discernible from the outside, or many times even from your own inside. Anyway. So what was found is that when you're told people to sort of not think of anything specifically, just relax your mind, just daydream, so a wakeful resting state, there were certain parts of the brain that were particularly activated. So it wasn't, again, just a diffusely everything is, is equally active, that there were certain brain areas that were active and the, you could correlate the activity of these brains that they were clearly linked together and the parts of the what came to be called the default network, default mode network, included the medial prefrontal cortex, this is the very front of the brain, parts of the posterior cingulate and precuneus, and parts of the angular gyrus of the brain. So what we've learned more about the default mode network is that yes, it's correlated with, you know, when you're in a daydreaming state, when you're wakeful resting state, when you're thinking about yourself, but also when you're thinking about other people and when you're thinking sort of autobiographically about your past or even about your future. So again, this is not the part of the brain that's involved in, I'm gonna go and do a task and do a triple flip off the diving board or going to calculate the square root of 437 or something like that. This is, but it's not that this, the default brain is not thinking or not engaged in any tasks. So earlier on, it was, it was confusingly referred to as sort of a task negative state. So again, it's more daydreaming, loose associations, thinking about self, others, feelings, past, future, autobiographical material. So to the other important networks we're gonna talk about with ADHD, the, the next one is called the dorsal attention network. And again, a name for either a different name for it or a slightly overlapping set of different um, brain centers is called the visual attention network. So again, some people use the terms interchangeably. Some subtly have slightly different structures involved or, but the dorsal attention network involves the frontal eye fields and the intraparietal sulci called type, uh, and dorsal is sort of the dorsum is the back. So the dorsal, dorsal fin of a shark is what you see on the, eyes well, cutting the surface in the brain. That's sort of the top of the brain. The ventral surface in the human or an animal is the bottom side. So the ventral part of the brain is actually, if you tilt your head upward, it's the underside of the brain. So the dorsal attentional network um, is involved largely with voluntarily direct, uh, voluntary attention to visual spatial information. So it's a system involved in attention, perceiving the outside world, but primarily in a visual, visual spatial context. A separate attentional network, often called the ventral attention network, and there's some, again, overlap, but some people will distinguish slightly different connections and centers for it, but, but there's some loose connection between ventral attention network, salience network, and the cingulo-opercular network. 
So those are, that's, that's a network, again, on the bottom of the brain, primarily. Um, a big structure of the salience network is the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and also the anterior insula. And the salience network is for detecting and filtering out salient or important stimuli. And that can be both um, sensory stimuli, visual, auditory, smells, um, olfactory, tactile, or it can include emotional stimuli. So again, that's a different attentional network than the, the dorsal attention structurally. So jumping back to the ADD connection, what we find in several different studies is that people with ADHD tend to have a hyperactive default network at a time at when they're doing a cognitive task. So they are not turning off their default network as thoroughly or as well as people without ADHD. There also seem to be stronger connections between the default network and the dorsal attention network. And again, so that there is more crosstalk going on. So symptomatically, that, that may be why we're, you know, your, your tasks are interrupted by internally generated thoughts, feelings, states. Um, so that's our, our big finding so far. There's other, there are many other networks within the brain. There have been, so again, part of looking at the networks, we can look at how cohesive or closely connected or tied together that network is itself. And we can look at how well that network interacts or how closely tied it is to other networks. And in the ADD field, there are findings of both intra-networks so within a network differences and inter-network in terms of how different networks are interacting or coordinating or working with each other. Um, so again, some of the evidence so that there's strong correlations with ADHD and strong connections between the default network and the salience network and weaker connections between the salience network, network and the network I didn't talk about, sort of executive function, so sort of the acting and doing and organizing network. So again, there are both within network differences within ADHD and inter-network differences within ADHD. And some of the most interesting studies are sort of looking at, is any of this useful in terms of predicting outcomes with ADHD. And one very recent study looked at, they were calling it the singular opercular network. Again, some people would call it, they were, say they were looking at the salience network. Some would say there are differences between the two. But in, we know that one of the things that from previous studies, treatment with stimulant medications makes children's salience network over time normalize. Um, and this study found that in kids whose salience network, unlike, so looking at kids with ADHD, in kids who responded to medications, their salience network looked more normal at the time or throughout development than the kids who didn't respond, the kids who didn't respond to stimulant medications had an overly connected, so an intra salience network connection was overly wired, overly strengthened over time. And those were the kids who didn't respond to stimulant medications. Now, again, that's sort of at the level needs to be replicated in other studies. Um, so again, none of these differences so far either in connections between the default network and the salience network or default connection or within the default network or default and ventral dorsal attention networks. All the findings so far um, are on a spectrum. So we're not seeing huge group categorical. It's not that you can identify if this person has ADHD from how we see the default network communicating with other networks. So there's overlap, again, individuals. So these are talking about group average differences um, and group average differences aren't yet necessarily, aren't 
actionable ones in terms of either making a diagnosis or treatment. Um, some of the other things that are holding us back in the area is one is the resolution, even with the more modern magnets, high, high intensity magnets that are used for functional magnetic resonance imaging, the resolution gets down to about a cubic millimeter, which is pretty tiny. But within a cubic millimeter, there are tens of thousands of neurons and glial cells, and there are more than a hundred million synaptic connections in that tiny little space. And again, so we are blurring, averaging out tens of thousands of cells, millions of connections to make assumptions based on the level of resolution we can see right now. Also a, a, a big barrier is that most of what we're looking at when we're looking at functional magnetic resonance imaging and some of the other spec categories is actually looking at blood flow. Blood flow tends to correlate with activity of individual nerve cells, but there can be other you know, factors that have a big role in blood flow, just where the big blood vessels are sitting that may mask, obscure, or confuse how we're analyzing pictures. Another source of confusion is movement artifacts. So functional MRIs are very sensitive and MRIs to any movement. And given that kids with ADHD tend to be hyperactive and harder time sitting still, that could bring in areas of artifact that make studies of, M of functional MRI in kids may be more difficult to interpret the results. And another big factor, two other big factors is that most of the studies so far have been done on a relatively narrow spectrum of middle class white kids, more boys than girls, certainly in the ADHD research. How generalized that is to girls, how generalized that is to kids from other socioeconomic or racial groups is hard to know. And another big barrier to further studies like this is cost, even though the cost is coming down, it's still much more expensive to do an fMRI, functional MRI on somebody than to just give them a week's worth of Adderall and see how they're going to respond. So that's about all I'll say with the function. Again, I, I think how the brain is organized and structured is going to be, as we learn more and more about that, will be lead to greater treatment and diagnostic information about ADHD, but we're not there yet. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions, but I will pause a second. Next week's talk is going to be sort of much more clinical domain, and it's going to be on uh, whether the Myers-Briggs testing has anything useful to say about ADHD or sorting of individuals with ADHD. So stay safe, stay well, stay happy, have a happy Halloween, and I'll be back next week.